Yeah, I, I tell the people all the time, I'm not a gangster. I never was. You know, there's a lot of shit talkers out there. I mean, what are they going to do? Nothing. An all-new kind of major organized crime bust. 23 people under arrest now accused of stealing guns and cash. Today, police revealed four organized crime groups are wreaking havoc. From aggravated robbery to kidnapping, burglary, and more. Let's take a look at this. New pictures from court documents in this case. These are a few of the people who have been charged. And investigators say the money, tens of thousands of dollars, is all stolen. Welcome to this episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today I've got Derek Galanis. I'll tell you, it's kind of funny about, about Tony. You know, we used to go to clubs. Tony was more of a partier than Tommy. Tommy partied undercover like my brother. You know, that's very much like I'm not going to show you my cards. And we used to go to uh, to bars with Tony. And in L.A., you know, everybody let Tony in. They were, you know, king, princes of the city at, at such a young age. And Tony wasn't even 21 yet. They used to let him in wherever. Um, and we took him to Vegas, Vegas a couple of times. And he would get bombed out of his mind. And I swear to God, the kid urinated on a bar two, three times. And I saw yeah, yeah, it happens, right? It does, it does. That's that's why I was never that heavy a drinker, man. But, you know, you don't remember it anyway, so what difference does it make, right? Hey, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. So was there ever law enforcement following you guys? Did you ever notice them? Yeah, so I get back from Kosovo. Um, I was living there about two and a half years. And this is how delusional you get. And I compared this to, to John Gotti stacks. And by the way, I'm not comparing myself to John Gotti before anyone freaks out. But uh, so these DEA agents, I was having breakfast with my mom at this place. And I noticed them watching me and looking at me. There are two tables over or something. And my mom midway through the meal goes, you know, those guys are looking at you and listening to everything you say. And I say to her, yeah. No big deal. As if I was some movie star that needed to be listened to or something. Like, if I was some real hip criminal on it, I would have known, okay, the bus is coming in. Let me get out of here. But you get delusional in your own ego. You know, I just spent two and a half years with the Albanian Mafia and the K KLA. And, you know, I felt indestructible in the United States. You know, it was like petty stuff. Like, oh, really? We're in San Diego, California. Big deal. Um, and, you know, my mistake, you know, within two weeks, I was in jail. Um, and, you know, people ask, like, how could Gotti have said those things? How could Gotti have done those things? Gotti got lost in his own ego, man. I'm the king yeah. of New York. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm bigger than anything. And, and I think that just happens in that life. You know, you start feeling like God. And as soon as you start feeling like God, God lets you know how little you are. And now people are idolizing the one who ratted on Gotti. They're like, oh, he betrayed Sammy. But what about all the other people that Sammy put in prison? They don't talk about that. You yeah, know? brother. So, you know, people have asked me about the ratting thing a lot. You know, they say, well, Derek, you didn't roll. You didn't cooperate, but you wrote a book. And this is what I say to them. I said, look, I don't point fingers at Francis Gravano or anybody because I nobody do. knows. <laughs> yeah, well, there's I a million. <laughs> so, I mean, the bottom line is, is Stacks, we don't know the circumstances of their case. Like, did anyone know that my father and brother wanted to murder me after not paying me, after me having gone to jail for them and taking a B for their threatening me with 20? Like, could they relate to that? No, they couldn't. You know, I know people bring that up about Sammy. And they say things like, well, John was plotting to kill him. He was setting him up and whatnot. And I'm sure that had a big effect on Sammy's psyche. You know, it had an effect on my psyche. So, you know, I just don't don't judge anyone else's cases. Do I do I say what happened though? Sure, I said Francis cooperated. There's no, you know, I don't know why he obfuscates. He 100 percent did. And by the way, I don't know his circumstances. I got no reason to, you know, meddle in that. And he did what he did, and I did what I did. And he swears he didn't. He swears he didn't cooperate. Listen, man. So I I will listen to a podcast about that. And then I went and I listened to a few things he had to say. 100% the guy cooperated. I mean, like everything he did was 100% cooperation. Now, he's got a lot, a lot of logic he uses. Like, well, nobody I took the stand against went to prison. Well, the, the guy got it thrown out on a technicality. I think his name was Norby Walters. Yeah, but, but there was a know, ripple effect. Some people went to prison that he probably doesn't even aware of. Like, yes. he talked about a lot of things with the government. He wasn't... He talked about some Chicago guys. He was locked up down in Florida. There was a lot to the case. 
Brother, you're absolutely right. I just, the reason I don't jump into it is because I don't know, right? Like, but I, I do, is that what happened? You bet, Stacks, of course. And what's interesting to me is Gabino and Francis are chummy in LA, right? That's where Francis' base is now. They're both in the wine business. And Rosario obviously taught Tommy, like, don't worry about that whole cooperation thing. I mean, not to, that Tommy's cooperated, but like, for like, you know, not talking to rats or whatever, he talks to him. I mean, Kenji Gallo, who was part of the LA crime family, refused to go on a show with me. Um, He was a cooperator. And he said some things I know only Tommy would have said. So I know Kenji got that from, from Tommy. So, you know, Tommy's hanging out with Michael Francis, Kenji Gallo. He's hanging out with all kinds of rats in LA. It's a different Kenji time Gallo's there. one of the worst, too. He. He cooperated like crazy. He put a lot of people in prison, the um, part of the Columbos, brought him a cell phone that was tapped. Yeah, it's a different time, man. Everybody's looking out for number one, the American way now. I mean, wow, that's insane. So what, what do you think about Merlino coming out on the podcast and people are calling him a cooperator now because he's on a podcast? Well, so with Joey, it's funny. My last case... Uh, I went in, um, in, I guess it would be late 16 and they busted the Merlino guys. Merlino's case came in right after that. Now forget the fact Merlino was tangentially involved. Forget the fact, excuse me, Merlino got bail. I got to hear about the case. Um, and from the guy who, one of the guys, so Lucchese guy named Mark Mayuso, he was my cellmate. He begged me to sell with him. Um, and, uh, you know, he told me about the rat going down to see Merlino in Florida. What, what do I think of Merlino now being on, on social media? I, I like him stirring the pot, man. I like him calling out Francis. I like him calling out Romano. Um, you know, it, it's funny to me to watch him call those guys and say well, what's what directly. Now, look, I mean, Joey, uh, like th just like they said, well, Derek, you wrote a book. You're a rat. Now people are going, Joey, you're online. You're a rat. You know, it, it never ends, man. Like, listen, so let me tell you this. Mark Mayuzo, they, they had a guy, it was a Genovese case uh, primarily, even though he's a Lucchese. And there was a guy named Zinzi. He wasn't a made guy, but an associate for years that supposedly had gotten busted and pretended to cooperate and didn't cooperate. And the Genovese welcomed him back. And the Gambinos say, well, yeah, but Zinzi's sketchy. So how do I say this? Whether you're on the street, whether you're not, whether you're in prison, whether you're not, there's a thousand ways to splice whether a guy cooperated or not. He did this, he did that. That's why, man, I don't point fingers. I don't do that stuff. So People move the goalposts. That's what yeah. they do. Oh yeah, they do. As yeah. as their realities change for what yeah. they need, they need to do to survive in their own minds. <laughs> Yeah, I, I tell the people all the time, I'm not a gangster. I never was. You know, there's a lot of shit talkers out there. I mean, what are they going to do? Nothing. So they're just going to keep watching this interview and they're get mad, throw shit at the screen. We don't give a shit. <laughs> right? Yeah, man. Listen, those haters, they, they, they drive me crazy. Here's the funny thing. Stacks, I want to say this. A couple of those guys have said, you know, Derek's a fraud in the mafia genre, blah, 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 blah. Well, let me say this. Not one of those dudes has gone into my book and picked out something that they say is false and did not happen. No, they don't do that. They make a generality. Derek is a fraud. Of the mob. Oh, really? Well, did you grow up, you know, with your father in prison with Rosario Gambino? Did you grow up with the Gambino kids? And by the way, the other thing is I'm bridging the gap from what the mob was before to what the mob is today. That is, I'm like sort of a missing link piece to that. And they don't want to hear it, you know, because they're, you know, dramatizing the 70s or the 60s or even the 80s and, you know, thinking about those times. But, you know, it is what it is, Stacks. Hate is going to hate. They watch The Sopranos and think they know shit about the mob. Yes. <laughs> you know. So what made you leave the country and what was it like being overseas and, and being in Albania and all these uh, Kosovo, you said? Yeah, so no sex. So my father was, he had just gotten out. He had done 13 on his 27 year bid, old law. So he got parole. Um, he, he was in New York and he, he was in the state. He had some state time to give him. They finally gave him work release in New York. And, you know, we, he, he uh, programmed into an Albanian owned restaurant. 
And the guy had a deal. The war in Kosovo had just ended. And my father was having problems with me. Why? Well, I was a mess up in the ecstasy thing. Why? Because finance really wasn't for me then, Stocks. You know, my mind wasn't in that. So you got to be very parochial. You got to have a certain look. My brother's a finance guy. I'm not. Now, I learned it when I went to prison. But it, it just was never me. And so my father said, do you want to do this uh, insurance company? we've got going on over in Kosovo with, with the guy I'm, I'm supposedly working for at this restaurant. I said, yeah, of course I do. I went over stocks. I never had a better time in my life. You know, it's, it's totally Eastern Europe. It's a man's man's world. I felt like, Oh mom, I'm home. You know, finally everybody's not saying like, you know, I'm a freak or I'm aggressive or anything else. Like I'm normal over here. Yeah. So yeah, I loved it, man. So you were involved with the ecstasy business. What what made you get involved with that? And what can you walk me through situations like how that even began? Yeah, brother. So my father's sitting in Terminal Island with Rosario, among other people. And one of the people was a guy named Dennis Alba. Now, Alba was Italian. You can tell by the last name, but he wasn't mobbed up or anything. He was an old school drug dealer. You know, my father calls them the yuppie drug dealers. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of, you know, generally white guys that would seem like they'd be yuppies, but they're not. Dennis was a chemist, you know, and and he used to make meth. Dennis uh, the chemist. <laughs> you bet. And that, he was also a computer programmer. So John sent him home to work on one of our, our scams. And I talk about this in the book. We finished the scam and Dennis gets next to no money. And I think Dennis figured, OK, I get it. But this is a great cover. So he kept the cover of I'm working for the Galanises in this finance business. And meanwhile, he ran ecstasy labs on the side. First, he had it coming in from China. Then he started setting up labs in San Diego. And you got to remember, Stacks, I'm early 20s. You know, looking for a place, can't find myself because, you know, finance isn't really for me. And I'm trying to think, what am I going to do? And he's like, can you sell these? I'm like, can I sell them? Of course I can sell these. And away I went. Yeah, but so he would bring you, what would he bring you, the packages? And what would you do with it? Where would you bring it? How would you meet the people to sell it to? So so ecstasy was, you know, uh, so cocaine and, and many of those things are done in kilos. Ecstasy was done what's known as boats. So a boat of ecstasy was a thousand pills. And uh, what I used to do is I sold them to people I knew, Stacks. So, you know, there was never any danger. I felt like I was Al Capone. The truth of the matter was I was a snot-nosed kid, you know, messing around in an area that, you know, did, I didn't really have any idea what was going on. But I figured if I limited, you know, my uh, exposure, it would be okay. Now, did a couple times I, I go beyond that. Yeah, one time I was with Tony and I was in L.A. And Tony knew about the lab, too. And he said, Derek. Bring me some ecstasy, man. I can sell it for you. And I, I stopped and I thought to myself, I mean, you got to know Tony. Tony's not the kind of guy that's going to pay you for drugs. What he'll do is he'll take the drugs and he will just never pay you. So yeah. I, I didn't do anything with Tony. Now, the Tommy thing came when I got back from Coastville. My, my insurance business went under. I needed quick money. And Alba told me, hey, can you talk to Tommy? And that's when I talked to Tommy. That would have been big had it gone through. But the feds busted us ahead of time. So so if you're going somewhere else in the country, how do you get these pills? And, like, you're not going to fly with them, right? Well, I, I distributed locally, Stacks. I mean, I, San Diego, Las Vegas, L.A., there was, I, I never had to fly or do anything like that. I mean, listen, I've been involved with organized crime enough to watch people send marijuana through the mail and through FedEx and everything. Yeah. You can bet you can send ecstasy through it too, you know? So what, would you front the pills and then they would distribute them, give you the money back? I never fronted, brother. I had spent some some of my childhood years down at Mission Beach in San Diego. And I got to know- I've been there, people. Mission Beach. Yeah. Yes, I've been and, there. And it's a lot of fun now, right? Like, but back then it was it was rough, right? Like it was still fun, but it was a rougher element. And I, I realized that fronting wasn't the way you wanted to do business. So I took cash up front, brother, because my theory was nobody's gonna pay me if if I don't do this. So yeah. That's wild. So how long did you stay over in Kosovo and all that? And where it's did funny. you stay? So what was what was the business like over there? I was awesome, man. So I, I was selling third-party limited liability car insurance. And I tell you, Stacks, I wrote about this in my book, man. It would have been the windfall of all time. That year, they sold all the companies, $20 million in insurance total. The claims were about a million. 
if they had done what I suggested, meaning the guys in New York, my father, the Albanian, everything, we'd have made 19 million bucks in one year. Um, but, you know, everybody's got an ego. Everybody's pushing back and forth. So we partnered with AIG and AIG set the rates above the market. And nobody wanted to buy it. I mean, so it was really, really like a, how do I say this? I, I could have kicked off to something really big, but stacks, I also know something else. If my young ego had made, you know, 15 million bucks, 19 million bucks on my first deal in my late twenties, I would have landed up with the same ego as John Gotti. Like, oh, I'm a genius. This is why this happened to me. When really it's fate, man. In war zones like that, like I guarantee you, man, right now, there's guys profiteering in Ukraine because the money flows outrageously, brother. Like, and 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 I'm talking cash, you know, cash doesn't really exist anymore. I guarantee you it does in Ukraine. Yeah, that's insane. Like, so you think they're they're doing insurance and what was the what was the biggest score you ever got like what's the most money you ever made at one well, one time well we just no stack so let me say this i was not an earner okay my my biggest my biggest shot to actually making money was with that Kosovo deal that didn't go right for a variety of reasons um, was very close though. I, you know, I've never made a ton of money in, in anything I did, including the drug business. And that's why, you know, at almost 50 years old, I woke up, I said, wait a minute. I took the rap twice. You know, this, all this, this, all this prison time. And it wasn't for $30 million. Right? Yeah. This isn't working out, man. Yeah. You know? <laughs> No, the scales no. of justice are not equal in this country. And that's when I said, okay, I got to get out of this. And that's when I started doing, I got a job, you know, I married my wife and, you know, I talk about my old life, but I'm the first one to tell you kids out there, please be aware. Everybody's looking to take advantage of you. Maybe your own father and brother, maybe they'll want to kill you. Mine did. So you just got to be really careful stacks. I'm the streets. No fun, man. Definitely. So what what type of stuff was Hunter Biden involved with with your brother? And when did they first link up? And and uh, was was Joe Biden aware of all this going on? Yeah. Well. Okay. So th what they were doing was my father's investment advisor scam. Scammy's been running stacks since the nineteen seventies. Um, effectively, what you do is you buy investment advisors. And I don't want to get too in detail with you, but I can. Um, so let's say you have an investment advisor, excuse me, of a hundred million dollars. The guy who runs that makes about a million bucks a year. They make about 1% of assets under management. But when that guy wants to sell that business, it only sells for about two times earnings, meaning two times 1 million. Why is that? Well, Stacks, a lot of those businesses are friendship based, right? The, they get to know you, they like you, they trust you. Uh, the market can also turn against you. But for whatever reason, think about this. You can buy a hundred million dollar investment advisor for two million dollars. So now, if you're involved in organized crime or you're a criminal, uh, do the math real quick. I put up two million bucks, and I have access to a hundred million dollars. Now, if I'm just a straight thief, I wire as much as I can over to another country. Now, if I want to pretend like it's real, maybe I just take five or six mil. And I put it in the investment that I'm trying to make work and whatnot. And guys, the really blessed guys get away with that their whole life. They never get in any trouble, right? Like they go, no, no, no it was a, a wine deal I was doing in Canada or whatever, and it didn't work out. But that's what my brother was doing on a, on a billion dollar level with Hunter. You know, um, my brother was versed in that skill from my father. He trained all of us, not openly, but you got the joke after a while. Um, yeah. And that's what Hunter was involved in. It was what Devin Archer was involved in. And in fact, the funny part to me, it's humorous. They bought uh, Burnham Lambert. The, the results of Drexel Burnham was the original company. That's Michael Milken's company that he pulled that huge bond scam with. So they took the remnants of that company. And they made it their figurehead to go buy these investment risers around the world. What a giant ripoff it would have been if it got to fruition. Now, the feds, they're really cute. They charge my brother like they, they the case is this big. They exit off right there and they charge him. Why? They want to keep Hunter safe. They don't want Hunter in trouble, right? President's son's going to jail. Is it going to help? So, yeah, that's what my brother was talking about in front of Congress and 
Yeah, man, that's the deal. The investment advisor scheme. I go over it in my book a lot, in a lot more detail. Um, it's brilliant and simple. You know, a lot of these scams, stacks, people go, oh, mastermind, this and that. None of them are that difficult, man. The what yeah. makes them happen is the charm. If people believe in you, if you can charm them to get your own way, you're in. And my brother and father are masters of that. I have no charm, stacks. That's my problem. <laughs> so do you think Hunter Biden will ever be held and brought to justice for all the crimes he's committed? Don't know, brother. I mean, listen, we're living a really weird time. Like, let's say Trump takes back the White House, right? Uh, at that point, will he even care? Or will it be something he gives to the public, right? Because, you know, he's got to he's gotta appease the crowd at that point, right? You got to have bread and circus. That would be the circus. Yeah, we're going to lynch Hunter now. Will that, I don't know, man. I mean, you know, it's funny too. Really, what all they're fighting over is power. Uh, so, at the end of the day, your guess is as good as mine. I do love how nobody is questioning my brother, though. It's hilarious. Like, they're not questioning anything. He said, just like those internet haters on me, they just say, Derek is a fraud. They don't talk about specific things that, that they say are a lie. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, that's how it is. I mean, what are you going to do? You can't well, win. Doing, brother. You can't win with them. And, and no. that's it. You got to just keep it moving, man. Yep. I bet you they're watching this one, though. <laughs> I hope so, bro. And listen, all you haters out there, man, you come, come directly to me and with, with your ideas. or Go buy the book. Go buy yeah. the book. Yeah, it's funny. You know, one of the biggest ones was Jeff Nadeau, and he likes to do research, and he, he, read, a, he read a lot of my court records. I um, mean, one of the things he I don't read, know who that is. So he's a mafia guy in Philly. He's Albanian. And he does like, you know, I don't know. He, he interviews guys and he does stories on guys. And he said, you know, I read the court records. Derek Alanis was only in Kosovo four months. Stacks, let me tell you how this happened, okay? I get busted, right? I get a high-powered lawyer named Michael Panzer. Nothing but the best. Michael's an awesome lawyer. Um, and he's trying to get me out on my bail hearing. But, you know, you only meet your lawyer for like 10 minutes before that. You know, there's no in-depth discussion. Yeah, yeah so, it's quick. So he gets out there and he says, my client was in Kosovo for four months. That's it. And he comes back to me in the middle of the argument. And I talk to him. I go, Michael, look, man, I know you're trying to make me not look like a flight risk, but I was there two and a half years. He goes, oh, I didn't know that. But now idiot Jeff Nadeau, who's looking it up, like in court records, well, he said that in court once. That's what it is. Get, get out of here, man. Hey, listen, a lot of things on paper aren't what they seem, you know? They have one perspective. It's like reading the newspaper and believing everything that's in there. It's definitely not the truth. You bet, brother. And that, that goes back to the, the perspective story. And that's why I don't I don't throw stones at the whole rat issue. And like I don't I, because like you said, moving goalposts, man. Everybody's reality is different. Like if Nadu had come to me and asked me that directly, I could have given him the real on that story. I mean, one of the things, Stacks, my short-term memory is terrible. Like what you say to me today, I might forget for the next week or two. But my long-term is like ridiculous. And that's how I wrote my books. Um, and when when I when I heard Nadu talking about that, I knew exactly what he meant. I'm like, no, dude, this is how that happened. Some people think they're smarter than uh, everybody else. That's definitely I, not the case. I know a lot of those people. Yeah, me too. But yeah, man, you're welcome here anytime to tell your stories and we we can keep this going all day, you know? Thank you, brother. Listen, it's guys like you, Adrian Martinez, um, you know, Tom Lavecchia, that, you know, let me get on and tell my stories. And I'm so grateful to you guys, you know, to have that outlet, to be able to talk about it. And, and the one overriding thing is I'm talking about it because I don't want what happened to me to happen to anybody else, you know, and, and that's the main thrust of what I'm doing here. No, you're just in it for the money. <laughs> no money, brother. <laughs> I know. Like, you're not going to get rich off of this shit. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Is there anyone else you want to give a shout out to before we go? No, I mean, all you guys who have been having me on, you know, I love you guys, man. You give me an outlet and it keeps me sane in an insane world. So thank you, brother. Definitely. Anytime. And if you like this content, hit the like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you can get my videos every time they drop. And if you don't like this content, do fucking bad. Start your own podcast.